Hey there everybody, Jandor here, bringing you part one in my three-part series of the International Four Invitee Primers. I'm going to be talking about all the different teams that were invited to the International Four for this year, kind of giving you guys a little bit of an overview of what to expect, who they are, some statistics, things of that nature. But to start, we have part one, the champions, the three teams who have won an international. And we are going to get started with some basic information. So say you don't know the international very well, if you're new to esports, if you're new to Dota 2, if you're not sure what this whole TI4 thing is all about, let me give you some brief information. It is the biggest Dota 2 tournament of the year. Uh, it is hosted by Valve, located this year in Seattle's Key Arena. Last year it took place in, I believe, the Convention Center, but due to the fact that the popularity has been blowing up as much as it has, I decided to move it to the new venue, which is probably a good thing because it sold out in about an hour since it, from going on sale. This is going to be a huge event. It's going to be very, very cool. And if you're like me, you're going to be watching it from the comfort of your own home on Twitch because you did not get one of those tickets and don't want to pay a scalper for the privilege of going. Uh, there is a compendium. If you go into the Dota 2 client uh, through Steam, things of that nature, you can now buy for $9.99 the compendium, which goes over all the different teams. It kind of gives you a sense of what to expect. It has ways to level it up. It provides in-game items. It provides money to the prize pool. It does a lot of really cool things. You can get that in the client. And as I said, the proceeds go to the prize pool, um, which is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, in esports. How big, you may be asking? Well, last year, the prize pool for the International 3 was a total of $2,874,381. Pretty respectable, if I do say so myself. That was probably one of the bigger prize pools ever in esports history. This year, the current TI4 prize pool, as of this recording, 4 million. $320,130 and counting. It's been going up all day as I've been working on this. I keep seeing the numbers tick up. So I can only imagine what it's going to cap out at. It's been blowing up ever since the compendiums went on sale. Remember, Valve supports or provides 1.6 million of the total prize pool, if I remember correctly. The rest has all been supplied through compendium sales and sales to upgrade compendiums. So you can see the community is very big and is very dedicated, and this is really, really good for esports. I love the fact that there's so much money here. This is going to give a number of teams, with any luck, a lot of capacity to keep playing professionally, to keep doing this full time, bringing new strategies, and kind of making this sport more and more popular, more and more viable as a career path, which is really good for everybody for the game for the hobby, for the sport, for all kinds of stuff. It's awesome. So, there are going to be a total of 16 teams competing in the International Four, 11 of which are invitees, which I will be going over over the course of these, these videos. There are four regional qualifiers. All right, China, Europe, North America, and Southeast Asia. Bear in mind, North America includes South America, so really it'd probably be more accurate to say the Americas and Southeast Asia. Um, these qualifiers have a number of teams competing. The winners of each of those qualifiers will get a place in the tournament. And the last place, the 16th spot, will be filled shortly before the International Force starts in a small tournament that will take place between the runners-up of the qualifiers. So I believe the second place um, teams from each of the qualifiers will compete head-to-head, -head, and the winner of that group of four will get the 16th spot and compete in the International Four. So there's lots of really cool stuff going on. There's wild cards, there's the old names, there's new names, there's going to be all kinds of sets. It should be a really interesting tournament, for sure. Let's introduce the invitees. That's why you guys are here, right? For the invitee primer. Note, I took all the player and team statistics from Join Dota and Liquipedia. Starting with the Alliance, the reigning champions. The Alliance's Join Dota rank, sixth in the world. Let's take a look at the roster. Team captain, Jonathan Lodeberg. This gentleman right here, always seen with his signature hat. We also have Gustav S4 Magnuson who typically plays their mid-roll, just gentlemen right here. Following that up, we've got Henrik Admiral Bulldog Anberg, the Admiral Bulldog. And we have Jerry EGM Lundqvist, also always seen with his signature hat. And finally, last but not least, we have Joachim Ake Actorhall, this gentleman right here, who rounds out the five players of the Alliance. 
So we're going to go ahead and take a look at each player individually, starting with Loda, the team captain. His joined Dota rank is 31st, home company home country is Sweden. He has 467 career wins, 223 losses, which is about 700 total games played, which, or a little less than that, which is pretty insane if you ask me, but there you go. These guys are professionals for a reason. His win rate, 68%, very respectable. His position, first. This means he is the team's carry, tends to be the one that prior they prioritize giving the most farm to. You can follow him on Twitter, at Lodeberg, and we're going to take a look at some of his heroes. So his best hero, the Bounty Hunter, his worst, the Beastmaster, and his favorite hero, the Life Stealer. Nakes the Life Stealer. Um, Bounty Hunter obviously is a really interesting hero, lots of roaming ganking potentials, lots of kill potentials. Beastmaster, not always the easiest hero, not typically a carry role either, so it doesn't surprise me this would necessarily be Lotus Forte if they have him in the first position now. And Life Stealer, well, I mean, Life Stealer is a classic uh, carry. He's really dangerous, he's very survivable, very tanky, can be very formidable if played properly and with the right lineup. Next, we have S4, the position two, the mid. His joined Dota rank is 32nd. His home country, also Sweden. He has a win rate of 67% from 472 wins and 229 losses. He can be found on Twitter at S4 Dota. And we're going to take a look at his heroes as well. His best hero is the Pudge. His worst, the Luna. His favorite, the Magnus. So, Pudge is an excellent mid hero. Lots of abilities to make games or make plays happen. Very, very powerful hero. Luna, a carry. So again, if he's typically playing a mid role as a, at the two position, it's not necessarily surprising that a carry like Luna might not be his best hero. But his favorite, Magnus, he is known for his Magnus. Magnus is an excellent hero, can make a lot of plays happen. Saw a lot of popularity during the TI3 days before some patches have kind of moved him out of the meta. Um, but he made some really sick plays happen with Magnus during those tournaments and uh, is generally a pretty solid playmaker. Admiral Bulldog comes in at a joined Dota rank of 30th. He's also from Sweden. He has a win rate of 68% with 465 wins to 218 losses. He is their position 3. This means he's typically played in the off lane, as you'll see from the heroes that come up next. You can find him on Twitter, at Admiral Bulldog. Now those heroes we were talking about. His best, the Viper. His worst, the the Tidehunter, and his favorite is the Nature's Prophet. Nature's Prophet obviously being an excellent jungle or offlane hero. Um, the Viper could also be potentially played in an aggressive offlane tri-lane or things of that nature, and the Tidehunter is tough to use, I'll, I'll admit it. Um, you may see at the International some Nature's Prophet play. It's been falling off a little bit in the meta from where it was at TI3, but during TI3 there were more than a couple of games where Admiral Bulldog split pushing um, Nature's Prophet or sometimes his split pushing Lone Druid were really driving teams up the wall because he would be in their base taking towers while they were busy fighting the rest of the team elsewhere. So he's an excellent player. Next we have Ake. He is a joined Dota rank 28th from Sweden. He is the position 5. He is the hard support on the Alliance. You can find him on Twitter at follow Ake. His 67% win rate comes from 475 wins and 230 losses. We're going to take a look at his heroes now. His best hero, the Skywrath Mage. His worst hero, the Nyx Assassin. And his favorite, the Chen. Chen being an excellent jungling hero. Um, very solid support. Can make lots of really cool plays happen. They were pretty popular playing him back during TI3. Skywrath is a roamer and a jungler. Typically played mid. Um, and then, of course, you have the Nyx Assassin, who is a tough support. Um, sometimes is played offlane. Sometimes is played mid. Typically wants to get his level so he can roam and create space, but can be tough in the laning phases. So he is not the best with the Nyx Assassin. We may, however, see some Chen play during the TI4, so keep your eyes open for that. Finally, rounding out the alliance is EGM. He has a joined Dota rank of 29th. His home country is Sweden. 411 wins to 190 losses gives him an overall win rate of 68%. He is the position 4. He is another support on this team. Slightly more farm priority than Ake has, but still playing the support role. You can follow him at follow EGM on Twitter. And we're going to take a look at his heroes. 
His best is the Elder Titan, his worst is the Invoker, and his favorite, the Rubik. Elder Titan is a pretty powerful hero, uh, has been in the past, hasn't been seeing a lot of play lately, but certainly has uh, the capacity to make plays happen in the right lineup. And Rubik is just an excellent all-round support pick. You'll see him come up a couple of times in this video. Uh, he just, especially in the hands of a skilled player or someone who knows the game well, so you know which abilities to steal and anything of that nature, he can be very, very potent. Um, and sets up kills and is an excellent support. And then the Invoker, well, the Invoker is not really a support, so it kind of makes sense that EGM might not have him as his best hero ever, at least amongst the pro scene. Let's take a look at some team highlights. So they are the reigning champions. They crushed the opposition in TI3. These guys came out of the gate hard and just kept running to the finish line. I don't think they lost more than a handful of games in the entire tournament. We're just a very, very dominant force, and they ended up defeating Nodis Vincere, or Navi, 4-3 to three in the finals. It was a heck of a set of matches, I must say. Now... The Alliance was only formed in 2013. In fact, they were formed a mere four months before TI3 started. So this is a team that is still fairly young. They will be, they'll have been together, I think, a little around a year, a little more than a year when TI3 or TI4 starts. They have a bit of a rivalry with Na'Vi. It's one of the more popular narratives in esports, at least amongst the Dota 2 scene, is their sort of rivalry. They tend to go head-to-head -head in a lot of matches, and one will win, and then the other will win, and the other will win. There's kind of a back and forth there but they have multiple first place victories and strong showings at a lot of major tournaments. So these guys are a pretty solid team overall and were very dominant in the 2013 year. Let's take a look at their performance graph, however. So this performance graph shows wins losses um, by month from 2013, starting in July of 2013 through to April of this year. What we can see is a trend of their losses going slightly down overall while their, sorry, while their wins going slightly down overall, while their losses increase. What this tells me is that they have, their performance has been slacking since 2013. Um, they've been probably been playing more games. You can see, especially in March and April, they've played a large number of games. Um, and at the beginning of this year, they looked like they were taking a bit of a break, but weren't having the greatest of seasons, weren't quite as dominant. Now, this isn't necessarily a reflection of their winnings in general. We'll get to that. But it does show that they are starting to lose more than they were losing back when they first formed, and certainly back in the summer of 2013. Uh, some of this, I think, can be attributed to just general fatigue. You know, the esports, the Dota 2 tournament scene is crazy. There is stuff happening constantly. You're always playing, you're always in tournaments, and it's got to be really hard to find time to rest or to train or to practice with your team in between all of those games. And you don't really want to be practicing stuff, new strategies, new hero things like that, in a tournament if you can avoid it. But sometimes I think these guys have no choice but to really try and, and be flexible and, and dive in on things they're not really comfortable with because the schedule is so aggressive. So it remains to be seen what happens with t with uh, the Alliance, whether or not they are able to turn this this around. But as you can see, at the current moment, their win-loss starting to dip more towards even. Overall, however, they have 475 wins and 217 losses, giving them an overall win rate of 69%, which is really high. These guys are really good, and if they're able to get back that magic they had last year, I think they're going to be really strong contenders. Now, notable heroes. Their most played hero is the Nature's Prophet. We talked about Admiral Bulldog being very good on that hero. The most wins is when they've played Slark. Their most banned hero, the Bat Rider. No surprise there. Bat Rider was basically first pick, first banned for a while, especially around the TI three times. And their least number of wins, the Ancient Apparition. A hero that, frankly, has been coming back into the meta, but it's not always easy to use. And um, so I guess they might have been trying him out and things haven't been working out for them. So we'll see if that continues or if they decide that they want to scrap him from their lineups or if they work on him and, and bring him back in and surprise us. Now, after absolutely dominating the scene in 2013, their showings at tournaments in 2014 have not been as good as we talked about with that, that performance graph. So they lost to Team Empire and ended up taking 5th, 6th in the Star Ladder Season 9 series. They lost to Team Empire again, took 4th place in the Dota 2 Champions League Season 2 tournament. They lost to Fnatic and took 4th in the Dota 2 League Season 2 tournament. And they lost to Na'Vi, took 3rd place in the Asus ROG Dream League kickoff season, which I think was at the beginning of this year, towards the end of last year. Um, they're still, however, a very strong team. I think overall, looking at the different players, looking at the general statistics, these guys 
should not be counted out. And I think they're going to be excellent contenders to do well in TI4. Very recently, they took first place in the DreamHack Bucharest Tournament 2014. So you know they've still got it a little bit. And I think with some rest and recuperation, some time to practice, they might come out swinging and be a strong contender at this year's International. Now, we're going to talk about Nautis Vincere, Navi, a fan favorite. Their join Dota team ranking is 11th. We're going to start with the lineup. We have Team Captain Clement, Puppy Ivanov, this man right here. Uh, if you see somebody towering over everybody else at the tournament, it's probably Puppy. The man is huge. He's also hilarious to watch in interviews or just in general. Next up, we have Oleksandr Hvost. Yes, that's how you pronounce that. Uh, Dashkevich, this gentleman right here. Following that, we have the one and only Danlo Dendi Ishtun. This gentleman right here, who you may recognize from Valve's documentary, Free to Play. Following that, we have Hlib Funik Lip, uh, Lipatnikov. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> uh, Funik is this gentleman right here, sporting the sweet Alienware shirt. And finally, last but not least, Kuro, Kuroki Salehi Takasomi. This gentleman right here. Let's go into the details, shall we? First and foremost, we're going to talk about Puppy. So Puppy has a joined Dota rank of 49th. He is from Estonia. He has 475 wins and 230 losses, giving him a win rate of 67%, which is very good. His position, fourth. He is one of the team supports, um, getting a little more farm than the position five would, but still being in the support role. You can follow him on Twitter at Clementinator, and we're going to take a look at his heroes. So Puppy's best hero is the Bat Rider. His worst is the Dragon Knight, and his favorite hero is the Chen. Used to be, and I think this is still somewhat the case, you could farm a Bat Rider in the jungle, get him a blink, and start making plays, having him be kind of that support four role there while you have other playmakers in mid, off lane, and, and your carry. Um, so it's not surprising, and Bat Rider was banned, first pick, first banned for a reason. His worst hero being the Dragon Knight, again, not terribly surprising if we're thinking of him as a more of a support role. Dragon Knight kind of tends to want some farm, wants to push towers down, wants to kind of be in a fight as a core more than a support. However, the Chen is classic support hero, uh, very good, similar to Ake back from the Alliance. Um, Chen doing the same thing, doing good work, making a lot of plays happen. Recently, I haven't seen Puppy playing a lot of Chen. I think I've seen him play more things like Crystal Maiden or other supports that are more popular in the meta. He might have tried Dazzle a couple of times. That hero has been very popular recently. But we'll see if they bring the Chen back for the TI4. Next up, we have Hvost. He has a joined Dota rank of 56th. He is from Ukraine. He has 471 wins, 226 losses, which gives him a win rate of 68%. He is the first position, which means he is... Navi's hard carry role tends to get the most farm priority. You can find him on Twitter at Navi Havost. His best hero is Lashrek. His worst hero, Morphling, and his favorite hero is Nakes the Lifestealer. Um, Lashrek is an interesting hero, typically played as a support, um, but I think can be, I don't know if you can really carry with him very effectively, but he certainly can do well with farm, like most heroes can. It's kind of interesting to see him as the best hero. This also may be a, a result of, of them switching Havost up to a uh, one position from a core or potentially even a support position somewhere early in, in Navi's history, um, where, you know, he was playing more Lashrek. Uh, his worst hero being a Morphling. Morphling, not the easiest one to, to play. He's been coming back. Morphling's been coming back into the meta recently, so we'll see whether or not that changes and they start picking a Morphling as a carrier, possibly as a mid roll, although the next player is usually their mid. And of course, Nakes the Lifestealer, classic, classic um, hard carry. Um, very, well, not, not the hardest carry in the game by any stretch of the imagination, but still a very tanky and powerful hero. Following, we have Dendi. His joined Dota rank is 58th. He is from Ukraine as well. His wins, 486 wins, 240 losses, giving him an overall win rate of 67%. Dendi is the position two on Navi. He is almost always going mid um, and playing those, those big, sort of powerful playmaking heroes in the mid lane. His Twitter, at Dendi Boss, if you wish to follow him. Let's take a look at those heroes now. 
His best hero, actually, a Zeus. His worst, the Pugnum. And his favorite, the Puck. Now, I believe the way they kind of calculate these things is based on overall win-loss ratios and um, how often they were picked in general over the long period of time that Join Dota is tracking. Because you haven't, I haven't seen him play Zeus in a competitive... I don't think I've seen anybody play Zeus in a competitive game in ages. But Zeus is a pretty solid hero. Uh, I think the new change to him kind of makes him interesting as well. Dendi is more known in general for Pudge and Invoker. Um, but still, it's kind of an interesting statistic. I figured I'd leave it up there. Uh, Pugna can be played mid, but is kind of squishy and tough to use sometimes. And of course, the Puck. Puck is great. He's a great mid hero, or she, the fairy dragon, and uh, can make a lot of interesting things happen. Very escapable, hard to pin down, um, able to get in, gank, and kind of set up team fights, initiate a lot of cool things. Things Dendi tends to like to do. Funic. His joint Dota rank, 54th, also from the Ukraine. He has 482 wins to 252 losses. He has a win rate of 66%. He has typically played a position three, so most the, most likely the off laner in any given match. You can find him on Twitter at Dota. His heroes, his best, the Gyrocopter. His worst, the Lycan. His favorite, the Darkseer. So Gyrocopter can be played sort of in an aggressive tri lane, uh, which can make sense for the off lane depending on what side you're on, and is a pretty powerful hero. Oftentimes played as sort of a, a hard carry as well, so it sort of depends on what role you want him to have him because he definitely has early ganking potential, or at least early kill potential. I don't know if you're really going to want to gank with him. Uh, the Lycan is a hero that's seen a lot of resurgence semi-recently, especially in the Star Ladder Season 9 tournament, although I think he's fallen back off with some changes they made in the most recent patch. Um, and apparently Funix doesn't like him very much. His favorite hero being the Darkseer. Again, not surprising because Darkseer is often played as an offlane. Um, you can solo with him pretty effectively. You can get farm. And if you guys want to see some really sick Darkseer play, take a look at some of the latest games from the North American qualifiers for the International Four where Team Liquid was drafting him. I think almost every game they drafted a Darkseer and was just making... It was just ridiculous how good this Darkseer was. Darkseer is a hero that was really, really popular, like another one of those first or second pick bands um, that you would see almost all the time. And it kind of fell off a little bit in the middle of the, towards the beginning of this year, end of last year. And I think it's starting to see a little bit of a resurgence. So it's going to be interesting to see what we see of Darkseer, haha, <laughs> in the International Four. Now we have Kuroki. Kuroki is joined Dota rank 53rd. He is from Germany. He has 442 wins, 270 losses, giving him a win rate of 62%, still very respectable. He is typically played in the fifth position, which is the support, hard support position. Um, so he will be getting farm priority slightly lower than what Puppy typically gets. His Twitter, at Dota, if you wish to follow him. Now the heroes Kuroki tends to favor. His best is Silencer, his worst is Axe, and his favorite is Rubik. Um, Silencer being the best hero, not terribly surprising. Silencer can be really, really dangerous. That global silence is very scary. Curse of the Silent is very scary. He's got a couple of really nice abilities that allow him to sort of debuff and shut down enemy heroes. Axe, Axe is kind of an odd hero. He's not really a support, um, so it isn't terribly or terribly surprising that Kuroki might have some trouble playing the axe or might not favor him very well when he does. It might be a bit of a role change up, things of that nature. But the Rubik, as we mentioned with the Alliance, Rubik's an excellent support. So it's not surprising to see that as a favorite for somebody like Kuroki. Now, team highlights. They were the winners of the very first international. They formed in 2010. They are fan favorites of a, of a sort. I think they tend to be one of the more popular teams, both from a personality standpoint and just from like an underdog standpoint. They always tend to be, which we'll get to down the line, um, they, they have a, a, an ability to sort of play when their backs are against the wall. It's very cool. And it's not at all uncommon, especially in major land tournaments, or any, any sort of tournament there's a lot of people, to hear the crowd chanting, Na'vi! Na'vi! Like over and over again as plays happen, as kills happen, or just as the momentum builds. Um, they're also pretty entertaining in interviews. Uh, so if you see Puppy or Dendi in an interview, they're, they always they have a tendency to sort of troll whoever's interviewing them, which leads to inter entertaining, if not terribly informative, interviews. And their team name is Latin for Born to Win, something I did not know, but it's pretty cool, I thought. Taking a look at their performance graph, however, we see again a trend. I mean, look at November. They played, how many is that going to be? Over 60 games in November alone, 
Um, this is professional games, by the way. It doesn't include any scrims or anything else, as far as I know. So that's a lot of games, but we're going to take a look at the trend line, and we see that their overall wins have been declining at a fairly steady, if not drastic, rate since July of 2013, while their losses have been ticking up at a similar rate. So Navi not doing as well now as they were back in 2013. Um, and potentially as they had been doing before. They haven't won an international since the International 1 either. I think they took second place in the International 2 and second place again last year in TI3. Remains to be seen if they're going to break that streak one way or the other in this year's International. But this, these graphs sort of, again, demonstrate to me that something similar might be happening with Na'Vi that's been happening with Alliance, which is that the teams, these these players must be getting sort of fatigued. There's a lot of games being played on a regular basis, a lot of tournaments, a lot of travel, and not a lot of time necessarily to, to recover. However, January and February were sort of lightweight months by comparison, and they're still not necessarily picking up their win-loss ratio. So, it remains to be seen what's going to happen there. However, overall, over the course of their career, they have won 490 games and only lost 239, which gives them a win rate of 67%, a scant 2% behind Alliance, who is one of the highest win rates in the league. Um, these guys are very, very good, and I, I think that they are going to continue to be good, even though things are a little bit rough for them right now. But it's an impressive win rate and an impressive number of games played, I must say. Notable heroes, their most played hero is the Rubik, their most wins is with the Pudge, Dendi Pudge, most banned, unsurprisingly, is Batrider, the least number of wins Undying, oddly enough. Um, so this is a team that apparently doesn't like running the Undying, or it doesn't do very well when they do. Uh, and the Pudge, well, Dendi is very, very good on Pudge, landing hooks all over the place. If you guys want to see some really ridiculous Pudge play, uh, search on the YouTube for, I think it would be something along with like Dendi Pudge Fountain Hook TI3. Something along those lines. There was a trick you used to be able to do with Chen and Pudge that is best just seen. So if you guys looked that up, take a look. It's pretty it's pretty wild. They did it in one of the um, the big, big matches in the TI3. It was a lot of fun. So as I said, they haven't won an international since the first. They lost last year to the Alliance, who are the current reigning champions. Um, it was a, a four to three w victory, but still the Alliance looking very strong in the games they did win. They did not do well in Star Ladder Season 9 either. However, I mean, they placed middle of the pack or a little bit higher than that, fifth, sixth, right around there, maybe seventh. They are still, I think, widely considered one of the better teams out there. Um, they consistently show that they know what they're doing and are pretty skilled. They tend to do well when their backs are against the wall as well. Like, it's not uncommon for Na'Vi to be in the loser's bracket and to come back and, if not win, certainly place in the top three, top two. And I would predict that they're going to be in the top six. Uh, at, at least in the top six. They might place higher than that, but I think given where they've been, it's not beyond the realm for them to be in that play. I think that's a pretty reasonable prediction to make. Now, if somebody is an up-and-comer, uh, kind of like what happened last year, um, they might place even lower because there's a lot of competition, but I think that might upset everybody. So overall, I would say top six. Now we're going to round out this video by talking about the third champion from the this is the uh champion of the international two invictus gaming chinese dota their joined dota rank fifth a very respectable fifth now their roster team captain zhang yyf sen and i apologize in advance if i butcher any of the pronunciations on these names this gentleman right here with the awesome face and the great photo <laughs> uh following up we have luo ferrari 430 fieschi this gentleman right here after Ferrari comes Yinki Lo Lo, or Luo, I think. Uh, this gentleman right here in the DXR chair. Following Luo, we have Wong Chan Hok Chan. This gentleman right here, the Malaysian member of the team. And last but not least comes Zheng Faith Hongda. This gentleman right here, who, uh, seen with a delicious blue glow from his screen, or whatever is making that blue glow. I imagine it's his screen. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get into the details of these team members, starting with YYF, the team captain. So his joined Dota rank is 22nd, home country of China. YYF has 238 wins to 117 losses, giving him a win rate of 67%. You can see that there's a trend, at least with this team, of players having win rates right around 67%, 66%, 68%. Um, that's why they're pros, everybody. His position, third. His Twitter, 
None. Uh, these guys don't have Twitters, so you can't follow them there. But we do know his best, worst, and favorite hero. His best hero is the Magnus. His worst hero is the Lashrak, and his favorite, the Nature's Prophet. Again, as an offlaner, most typically with that three position, these heroes aren't terribly surprising to see in these positions. We've already talked about Magnus and Prophet and Lashrak. So we're going to go ahead and move on. To Ferrari, 430. His joint Dota rank is 23rd. Very, very good. His home country, China. He has 242 wins with 121 losses, giving him a win rate of 67%. His position, the two. He's typically playing mid, um, second farm priority. Twitter, none. His heroes, Rubik, his best hero. His worst, the troll warlord. And his favorite, the dragon knight. We all know Rubik's amazing. Troll Warlord is a hero that I don't think I've seen a lot in professional play recently, but can be very, very scary if he gets up and going and has um, a really nasty ult that boosts his team and is generally just a pretty potent hero, but I think can be shut down fairly effectively. He doesn't have a lot of hard disable. Um, the Dragonite, on the other hand, is a great hero, typically played mid, which makes sense uh, for a two role. He can get, he can do a lot. He can do a lot of different things depending on what you want to build on him and how he's good in a team fight. He can push towers. Uh, he can stun from a distance in his ultimate form or up close when he's not in ultimate form and it's an instantaneous stun. He's got some wave clearing and pushing potential. Pretty solid hero overall. Uh, we've been seeing a little more Dragonite in some of the competitive play and I'd love to see some at uh, TI4. Now we have Luo. Luo has a joint Dota rank of 59th. His home country is China. Now, Luo is the only one in this group that has a negative win-loss ratio. He's 103 wins, but 140 losses, giving him a win rate of 42%. He is the first position, so he is typically their hard carry. He also has no Twitter. Um, bear in mind, he also has less games played overall than some of these previous heroes in terms of what's been ranked on joindota.com. So he might be adjusting to the position, he might be adjusting to the, the role or some of the new meta, things of that nature. So don't necessarily count him out because of his win rate. Especially since Invictus Gaming has a pretty solid one, as we'll see. Now his best hero is the Wraith King, his worst, the Bone Clinks, and his favorite, the Alchemist. All of these are solid um, carry type roles. Uh, you can typically see Clinks, I think he's usually played more as an offlaner. Or possibly a solo laner at the top or bottom, depending on where um, you are on the map, which if you're Dire or Radiant, things like that, because he has a number of escape mechanisms. Um, he can be pretty powerful. He has push potential, but is not always easy to use and certainly can be, can be shut down if he's caught out. On the other hand, Wraith King is like impossible to kill if he gets enough farm. Um, they've actually been playing Wraith King supports recently in the pro scene, which I really dig. But even as a carry, if you get him some mobility or get him enough items, he's just really really powerful and that ultimate of his just keeps getting better and finally the alchemist is a great carry as well lots of different lots of potential to do a lot of different things for the team at all stages of the game so we might see some more alchemist play in ti4 we definitely saw a lot of it in ti3 next we have chuan uh chuan has a joined dota rank of 26 he is from malaysia he has 148 wins and 77 losses giving him a win rate of 66 percent he is the position for support no twitter to speak of now, Join Dota didn't have the same information on Chuan and on the next player, um, that Faith that we were that I was using for the previous ones. So what I did is I pulled from the 20 re most recent games and took a look at the most the hero that was played most commonly on these on these care on these um, players. So for Chuan, he most commonly was playing Dazzle and Sand King over the last 20 games, which isn't surprising. Um, Sand King is very popular in the Chinese Dota scene, and I think is getting a little more popular in North America and some of the other scenes. He's a, a popular support there and can make a lot of things happen if he gets you know a blink dagger, some means of initiation, has a team that can kind of you know build around him a little bit. And Dazzle, obviously, we've seen is a very very strong support um, coming out. I think in Star Ladder and some of the other tournaments recently, and showing himself to be very very dangerous for a whole host of reasons. Those Graves can really turn the tide of a fight pretty handily. So for a position for support, it makes a lot of sense for these heroes to be kind of on his most played roster. Finally, we have Faith. His joint Dota rank is 59th, home country of China. He has a win rate of 66%. He is the fifth position. He is the hard support. He has 237 wins, 122 losses, giving him that 66% win rate. No Twitter to speak of. And the heroes? Well, his most recent heroes played were Enigma and Visage. 
Also two support heroes. Two support heroes that may rotate between that four and five position. You definitely want to blink on the Enigma. You probably want an Aghanim Scepter on the Visage if you can farm it. But they are very they are both very good and very different heroes, interestingly enough. You know, the Enigma, very powerful in the team fight, can jungle very effectively. The Visage has a lot of kill potential, a lot of scouting potential, things like that with the um, familiars. Both interesting heroes, solid supports. Will be interesting to see if they play stuff like this at TI4. So the team highlights for IG, they were the winners of the International 2012. They formed in August of 2011. They've been through multiple restructures and roster changes, like a lot, a lot over the course of their of their uh, the two three years they've been together. They placed fifth, sixth at the International 2013, so went from the champions to about the middle of the pack, a little bit better. Now with the current roster which is still relatively new. They took fourth place in Star Ladder Season 9, had a pretty strong showing there. They are personally sponsored by Wang Sikong, who is the son of one of the richest men in China, as it turns out. So that's kind of an interesting uh, change up from a lot of teams that have sort of these sponsorship deals with multiple companies, that IG is primarily sponsored by one guy. Um, if we look at our performance graph here, now this is a little bit different than the other two. IG has been steadily increasing the number of wins, while their number of losses has stayed pretty flat. Um, it looks like they've been playing more games overall as well as part of this increase, um, but they're on a sort of an upward trend. They came out at, you know, at the uh, Star Ladder Season 9, they did very well for themselves, taking fourth place is very respectable. Um, I don't know if anybody necessarily were expecting them, as opposed to, say, some of the favorites like you know, the Old Hands, Na'Vi, or the Alliance. Well, I say Old Hands, they've been around for like you know a few years, but that's how it works in esports. Um, and I think that this shows a good trend that if it continues will make them pretty strong, con very strong contenders in the International Four. Overall wins and losses, they've played far less games overall, at least with this roster, um, than the previous two teams. But we have 246 wins to 121 losses, which gives them a win rate of 67%, which is still right up there with the other two. So these guys are very, very strong. And notable heroes. So... Again, the team as a whole, I think because of the relatively new roster changes, doesn't have the same data on joined Dota that the other ones did. But if you pull from the last 20 games, the hero they played the most was a Dazzle. The one they won the most with was the Wraith King. And the one they won the least with was Enchantress. Poor, poor Enchantress, sproinking her way to losses instead of to victory. Now, I think the current roster, despite it's only been active for a few months, all right? These guys haven't been you know, together for a long time with this group of players. That being said, most of this current roster are players that have been on or off the team since it formed. Um, they had a very solid showing, as we talked about, Star Ladder Season 9, as well as the G League 2013 and the Red Bull ECL Grand Finals. And looking at their statistics, we saw a steady upward trend in wins and the win-loss ratio ticking more towards the win side. So I think if this trend continues, they're going to be very strong contenders for possibly even the top four at the International Four. So, that concludes the first video in the series about invitees. Um, the next video will focus on North American European teams, and the final will focus on the Chinese, remaining Chinese, Southeast Asian teams. Now, if you want to find out more information about any of the players, about the teams, about the sport in general, you can check out joindota.com for statistics. wiki.teamliquid.net slash dota2, Liquipedia, has a good dota2 page, which actually gives you a lot of detail about some of the history of these teams, their background, managers, things like that. And dotabuff.com is a good way to find statistics about different players or the teams in general, in addition to join Dota. Also, remember to check out the compendium for more information uh, in-game. It's a little less detailed than what I've given you, but kind of gives you some refreshers and brushes you up as we get into the tournament. And it also will allow you to watch all the games in client, which is pretty sweet. And remember, guys, share the video. Anybody you know that's interested or has questions about who these, guys, who these teams are, has questions about the international, send them the link. Get the video shared around. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, you can also subscribe to me on Twitch. I am twitch.tv slash... Captain Jandor. You can follow me on Twitter at Captain Jandor. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Leave comments in the in the comments section below. I love to have the conversation. Send me messages on Twitter. Anything you think, your predictions, you know, your feelings about these teams. I love to hear all that stuff. And I will catch you guys next time.